Let's pray and let's get into the Word of God this morning. Father, we thank you, as Johannes said this morning, Lord, that we can remind our hearts today that you are a good, good Father. And Lord, this morning, we ask, precious Holy Spirit, would you come, Lord, and deposit your Word into our hearts. Lord, that it, our hearts would be fruitful soil, that every seed that you sow in our hearts this morning, Lord, would bear much fruit in our lives and for your kingdom so that you can get the glory. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each one of us exactly what we need. And we invite you, Lord, we give you permission today to come and do what you want to do. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about a topic that I said, Johannes, I'm not going to put on Facebook what the topic is because then many people won't come. I used to be like this about this topic because it was not because I didn't want to come to church, but because I thought I didn't need, I didn't need a sermon on this topic. But I felt the Lord really speak to me in the last couple of weeks. It's been coming along. Sometimes the Lord drops a topic in my heart, and I will work on it for a few weeks until I feel like now it needs to come out. Now God really wants to address this. And it's a topic that I believe is actually relevant to every single believer. Even if we don't need it today or in this season, we will definitely need it tomorrow or in the next season. And it's the topic of forgiveness. So my title this morning is Breaking Free from the Prison of Unforgiveness. Do you believe, church, that unforgiveness is a prison? When we hold on to unforgiveness, it puts us in a prison spiritually, emotionally, and many times even physically. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me about, I mean, we've been teaching about forgiveness. You know, we do it in liberating the human spirit when we do that course. You know, we talk to people about it all the time. But I felt like as I went through a particular passage that we're going to go through today, it was as if the Lord gave me this new revelation of how forgiveness is the key for many of us to break free from the prison we're finding ourselves in right now. And I'm talking about the revelation about the fact that it is a key that is in our hand. We have access to the key. Who knows if you're in real prison, you don't have access to a key. It needs to be a, a, a pretty good miracle to get access to the key. But this is a key that we have access to. But we just need to decide to use the key. And so I feel like for some people this morning, this might be a word that touches very deeply, and it may be very painful. But I also know that the Holy Spirit is our comforter, and the Lord will never talk to us and guide us and command us in a direction that's not going to be for our good, even if it feels painful in the moment. But who knows, sometimes I need to go through the pain to get to the place of healing. Amen? And so this morning, we're going to talk about breaking free from the prison of unforgiveness. One of the biggest reasons we see, and we see this in counseling, we see this in ministry, we've been seeing it even on outreach, why believers are oppressed. You know, when, when we speak about the spiritual realm, we know that there is the kingdom of light, there is the kingdom of darkness. Demons are real, angels are real. All right, so there is a spiritual realm. And many times what we experience in the spiritual realm, we have a role in it. So in other words, if I keep myself busy with habitual and conscious sin, I'm actually opening up the door for the demonic realm to gain entry into my life. And sometimes we, we share this with people and maybe you grew up in a church or maybe you didn't grow up in a church at all where you've never heard the truth about how the spiritual realm works. So sometimes we find ourselves in a place where in Afrikaans protest van onkinder. I just didn't know. Well, the good news is that the Father is so good that He will lead us to a place where He can share His truth and shine His light upon our hearts. So that once we have the truth, we can make a decision to act upon it and then to become free. 
Because who knows, it's the Lord's heart for us to walk in freedom. It's no use we sing beautiful songs about Jesus in your presence there is freedom, but we never walk in freedom. Amen? And so that's the passion of our heart as a church. We want to see the Lord touch every single person and all of us walk in the freedom that we are all destined for. Because again, we, we cannot do a course on calling, but still be bound, because then we will never walk in the fullness of our calling. And you know, I want to say this this morning. Um, I wasn't going to share this, but I was just reminded. Yesterday morning, uh, we had a children's church social here at church, and our team came together. And by the way, our children's church is next level. We are going to share some testimonies that's going to blow your mind in the next, I don't know when we're going to do it, at some service in July. But I just want to encourage all the parents, just know that our children's team, like they put so much prayer and so much preparation in. It is incredible. If you've never been in the children's church or found out what they are doing, just take a moment, maybe one Sunday, and ask the team, hey, what did you do today? It's absolutely incredible. But anyway, let me not get lose focus. Okay, so we, were, so we were here at church yesterday morning, and on my way here, my mom called from Cape Town, and she said, Gran just passed away. And my grandmother was 95 years old. So I was a Tavatani, um, very strongly opinionated. I mean, I don't know. I don't feel like, you know, maybe we are related. But she was incredible. And, and you know what? My mom and I had been praying and you know, we've been expecting this. She was obviously 95, you know, she recently was diagnosed with dementia. So it was kind of like you, you're more relieved. If you've ever lost a grandparent, you, you're more relieved than, than sad, right? And, but I was reminded of in our journey with my gran, in this topic that we're talking about today, this was a topic where I know personally she struggled a lot in. And it was in 2019, I think, four years ago, that I was in Cape Town, and, and she was already in the old age home, and my mom and I sat together, and she could still have a conversation with me. And I just felt such an urgency on my heart to speak to her about this thing, this condition of her heart, about unforgiveness, about bitterness. And I also wanted to make sure, Gran, are you really saved? I want to make sure. Have you ever felt like with people in your family, man, do they know Jesus because I want to make sure I know where they're going after this life. Because this life is like a vapor. We don't have forever, church. Jesus is coming back, but also we might go back before he comes. But are we ready? So as my soak met die raag, is ek in die koninkryk. Dis baie belangrik. And so I felt a sense of urgency to talk to my gran. And I said to my mom, like, let's pray. And you know what? There was this incredible window of opportunity. I feel like, as Johanna said, an open heaven, a grace that day where she didn't give me an opinion. It wasn't like this type of back and forth conversation. She just listened and we had a conversation and she released and she forgave. She accepted Jesus and we were able to pray with her with so much peace. And yesterday morning when I received the call, I said, mom, do you remember that day when we prayed? And she said, yes. And I was so grateful we had that opportunity. And I felt like the same thing this morning is this is an opportunity for some of us. Church, like I, I really feel a sense of urgency. We're not in a season and a time in the world where we can think we have all the time in the world. We don't know what will happen this afternoon. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. So I want to appeal to you today. I feel a sense of urgency Today is the day for some people to let this stuff go. There is not more time. And so, okay, but that's my word this morning. So let's turn to Matthew 18. This is a long passage, but it's the word of Jesus. And it's a very, very powerful, but a typical parable of Jesus that cuts straight into the core of the issue. There is not a sugar coat in it. And it's called the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, many of us know it, but we're going to take some extra time to read through it this morning a little bit slower than maybe what we sometimes do. You know how you sometimes just skip over something. Well, maybe not this morning. So follow me if you can. If you've got your Bible or the notes are on you version. And I'm going to read through the whole thing. And then I'm going to go back verse by verse with a couple of things that really stood out to me as I was preparing. All right, verse 
21 to 35. Verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to him, this is Jesus, and asked, Lord, how many times will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him and let it go? Up to seven times. And Jesus answered him, I say to you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Now all the clever people are thinking, okay, 490, okay. And therefore, Jesus continues in verse 23, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the accounting, the one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But because he could not repay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything that he possessed and payment to be made. Verse 26, so the slave fell on his knees and begged him, saying, have patience with me, I will repay you everything. 27, and his master's heart was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him, canceling all his debt. But that same slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began choking him, saying, pay me what, pay what you owe me. And so his fellow slave fell on his knees and begged him for earnestly, have patience with me and I will repay you. Verse 30, but he was unwilling and he went and had him thrown in prison until he paid back the debt. And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, They were deeply grieved, and they went and reported to their master with clarity and in detail everything that had taken place. And then his master called him and said to him, you wicked and contemptible slave, I forgave all that great debt of yours because you begged me. Verse 33, should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave who owed you little by comparison as I had mercy on you? Verse 34, and in his wrath, his master turned him over to the torturers, the jailers, until he paid all that he owed. And Jesus concludes in verse 35, and he says, my heavenly father will also do the same to every one of you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. I know. You end with that and you're like, oh, wow, Jesus, I thought you were the good father. I thought you are the loving and mercy God. But here's the thing. How do we read this parable? And so I'm going to take us back and we're going to go through it a little bit scripture by scripture to see and to highlight the principle that Jesus is actually teaching in this parable. And by the end of it, I'm praying that you will see the goodness and the mercy of how Jesus communicates and illustrates it to us. Amen? Are you ready? All right, so what is the context in this chapter? Always when we chat to our team, we say, how do we read the Bible? I always want to read, even if I read one scripture, I want to understand the full context of what is happening in this passage. I can never take a scripture by itself and think I understand without looking at the whole text in detail. So what is happening In verse 21, and maybe the team can put up the scriptures again as I go through it. In verse 21, it starts off and it says, then Peter came to him. Well, whenever I read the word then or therefore or because or whatever, I need to go back to what was it saying in the previous scriptures. So if you read back, and I don't have it on the screen, but verses 15 to 18, Jesus is teaching on forgiveness within the church. Jesus is teaching us, how do I handle if someone here at church offends me or they sin against me? And Jesus teaches the principle, which is a very good study to do by yourself, is Jesus teaches the principle that if Stefan offends me or he sins against me, my first job is to go to Stefan directly and talk to Stefan. My first job is not to go to Facebook and tell everyone I know, what Stefan It's going direct to the person. Then it is, if he doesn't listen to me, Jesus explains, go and get two or three witnesses, okay? To listen to the story, to get some perspective, to sort it out. Because why? The heart of all of this is restoration. It's to get back to a place of unity. It's to get back to a place of restoration. Okay, so that's the context. Jesus is teaching about this. 
Peter and the other disciples are listening. And I love Peter. I feel like he was such a, <laughs> I feel like he was the guy that probably offended everyone the most. But he's the one asking the question about forgiveness. Okay. So he comes to Jesus. He's listening intently. And he goes, okay, Jesus, so how many times must I then forgive? Seven times. And what's interesting is in Judaism at that time, three times, forgiving someone three times in a row for the same thing or for something different was actually a huge sign of a forgiving spirit. So if I've forgiven you three times, okay, so then I have a forgiving spirit. Wow, amazing. Jesus knows his heart. So, so Peter is going, okay, everyone in the group knows three times is like, you know, up there. So he goes seven times. Double plus one, probably looking very awesome. And Jesus goes, I know your heart. I'm saying 70 times seven. So now for those of us who are counting, he's obviously not saying 490 times. The principle is unlimited forgiveness. The principle, Jesus comes with a kingdom principle. He says in that scripture, then the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus used natural stories to explain spiritual principles. He's saying, I want you to have a forgiving spirit with an unlimited capacity. Is that possible all by ourselves in the flesh? Absolutely not. Okay, so he says to Peter, it needs to be, yo, seven is great, but how about, you know, unlimited? All right, then he says in verse 23, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like, Remember, everything that Jesus teaches about the kingdom is going to be contrary, opposite to what we want to do in the natural flesh. So everything Jesus teaches is always going to have some sort of an angle on our flesh. Amen? It's not going to be comfortable. It's not always going to feel natural. Maybe that's an indication I'm busy with the work of Jesus when it's a little bit uncomfortable and when it's a little bit challenging. Sometimes we want to stay in a comfortable place, but that's not the kingdom. Amen? Amen? Are you still with me? Awesome. All right. So then, obviously, what is this parable representing? The king in this story that had the huge debt sin against him is the father. It represents God the father. And the first slave with the 10,000 bags or talents represent us, people who were born into sin, Romans 6.23. The Bible says we were all born into sin. So we were all born into a place of a huge debt that we owe the Father. And the, the principle here, again, is the 10,000 talents. When you go and work out, different scholars have different opinions of what the value today would be. But talents was another word that they used for currency, for gold, for money. Some scholars say in today's money and terms, it's, we're probably looking at something like 6 billion U.S. dollars. Ek my, wie van ons gaan daai enige keer afbetaal? 6 billion US, not NAM dollars, US. In other words, it could look like your whole lifetime's worth of wages. So again, hyperbole is something that we learn in hermeneutics when you uh, study the Bible. It's speaking about a debt that's impossible to repay. So what does this represent? It represents you and I with an impossible debt that we could never pay for our sins. That's the, where the whole story of the gospel comes in. That's where Jesus came, and only Jesus was able to pay because he was sinless. He was able to pay for our sins. All right, so you're still following that. So this is what the parable is representing. Both the king and the slave knew it, and the slave knew he had no other option but to fall down on his knees and to beg for the mercy of the Father. Because there was no way, even if he was thrown in jail, he would never be able to repay. And the king, what does the Bible say? Had compassion and had mercy. And he didn't give him a payment plan. He didn't give him a second sentence. He said, I release you totally from this debt. All is forgiven. Like it says in Colossians that he nailed our debt to the cross. So if, if I accept Jesus Christ, what he had done on the cross for me, my debt is forgiven. Do you see where this parable is going? It starts with first being forgiven. 
forgiven. Who's my Engels for Ochen? This is the It starts by me first accepting forgiveness for me. It's going to be nearly impossible for me to extend forgiveness if I've never received the Father's forgiveness for me. And this is a key that I think is literally going to speak to people this morning. Because some of us have been trying to release people and forgive people from a place of having never been forgiven ourselves. And that's why we're stuck. That's why we're struggling. So this is the, the idea of the parable. And in verse 28, the roles were reversed. And the slave was set free, he was forgiven, and the king released him. But then someone comes and owes him, this forgiven slave, a hundred denaries. Denaries, you know, you could compare the first one to gold and the second one to silver. And this was about maybe four months of salary in today's terms. So very doable, also a huge debt, but still very doable. You could throw someone in prison, which was their custom of the day, until the debt was repaid. I don't know how they earned money to pay it back in prison. But four months, you could have a payment plan. I mean, there's, there's a way you could pay that back, right? And this slave goes, I don't think so. You owe me 100 denaries, and I want it back, and I'm going to throw you in prison. And this is where the irony of this parable comes in, is that this often illustrates you and I, or believers in general, in today's life is that we have forgotten many times what we have been forgiven for and how we were completely unable to pay back the debt of our sin. Yet God released us in his mercy. He canceled all of our debt. He will never, ever again hold it in front of you. The Bible says guilt and condemnation are not from the Lord, not, not from Jesus Christ. But yet, many times people will sin against us and we withhold forgiveness from them. And so it could be, you know, many times I think the Bible talks about the heart as the inner life of man. And so everything that goes on inside of our heart will come out in our speech, in our motivations, in our deeds, in our actions. In other words, where does Jesus want the change to occur? In the heart. Amen. He wants change to occur in the heart. So in other words, when I come to the Lord and I receive full and true forgiveness for my sins, there has to be a heart transformation. Sometimes, and Johanna spoke about salvation a few weeks ago, and sometimes we think we are saved, but have we ever been in a place of weeping on our knees, begging the Lord for His mercy? Because then I'm not sure we understand what salvation is. Because all of us, Romans 6.23, were born into sin. Are you following where, where I feel like the Lord is leading us this morning? So if I'm struggling with forgiveness, maybe a question we need to ask ourselves is, Lord, do I have an understanding what I have been forgiven for first? Do I understand how much I needed your mercy because that's where it starts. I cannot give what I have not received. I mean, I know it's going deep this morning. Is it okay? Jesus' heart is for us to be healed. A transformed heart must result in a changed life. Church, I really want to say this as a, as a mom pastor this morning. Sometimes we journey with people, and I'm like, have you met Jesus? Have you, have you experienced his love for you? Has his love and his mercy and his forgiveness for you transformed your heart or not yet? Because then I want to pray for you. A transformed heart must and will result in a changed life. If nothing has changed, let's go back to Jesus. And so in verse 31, his fellow servants saw his actions and told the king. And we know that nothing is hidden from the Lord, not even the motives of our hearts. And that's why sometimes the Lord will take us there to show us what's inside of our hearts. 
And there was no mention of his unconscious feeling even guilty for not extending the forgiveness. That's why I personally think this, I'm not quoting, this is my personal opinion, is that I don't know if he ever experienced, if he had a full transformation in his own heart because of the forgiveness that he received. Because I think if he did, he would act differently towards this slave who only owed him a little in comparison to what he owed in the first place. This principle is no sin on earth is as great as our sin was against the Father. The way that God is a just God and He's a pure God and He's a holy God and sin offends Him and it hurts Him. But that's why He sent Jesus. Amen. And then there's an there's a, uh, image on the screen. In verse 34, the Master handed Him over to the torturers. And then Jesus said, my father will do the same to you. And this is the scripture that sometimes we feel like, but is that the God that I read in the Bible about? But again, let's look at it in perspective. This word torture, torturers, the Greek translated, translates it to an oppressive jailer. An oppressive jailer. And you know, when we stay in a place, we said in the beginning, when we stay in a place of unforgiveness... It is like we go into a place where we open that door for the oppressive jailer, the enemy and his demons and spirits to come and torment us in our mind, in our emotions, and many times physically with sicknesses and ailments in our bodies. We have prayed for so many people where we have seen miraculous supernatural healings from cancer to brain tumors to different things when they let go of unforgiveness. Seriously, I remember when we were in Malawi, we went on our first outreach and we prayed for this lady and her name was Joyce. I'll never forget it because I worked for a lady called Joyce at that time. And we went on this outreach and we were gonna pray for people and this lady was complaining with a lot of pain in her body. She was in a lot of pain. We always ask people on a scale of one to 10, how big is your pain? And she was like 11, 12 on a scale of 10. And we started praying, and we started praying, and we prayed for healing. We laid hands on her, we anointed her, and nothing was happening. And I felt, I was praying with a friend, and we both felt like there was something. So we asked the Lord for a word of knowledge. We were like, Lord, please show us, is there something triggering this pain? Is there something at the root of this pain? And I think my friend got a word of knowledge, and we asked her, is there anyone that you are having a very difficult relationship with, that you are... Uh, you're angry, you're hateful, you're revengeful. And she said, yes, her husband. Her husband ran off with another woman and she was left alone in her village with her children with no money, no job, no nothing. And she hates him. And so we thought, okay, wow, then this is clearly an open door. And so we started ministering to her and we shared the gospel with her. And you know what? She made a decision in that moment to forgive and immediately her pain left her body. We worked through a translator, but this was a very, very clear, I have no pain, it all left. And she was shocked. I remember her face. We were shocked, our faces. But I realized the power of forgiveness in that moment. How literally in the spiritual realm, it's a key that unlocks that prison where she found herself in physical pain. Um, I read the other day, uh, uh, I can't remember where I read it, but even in let's say, secular treatment centers for cancer patients. They've even brought in, along with all the medical uh, treatments and different things, they have brought in forgiveness as a teaching to help. Again, it's not everyone's root and problem. Don't go pointing out to people, yeah, it's unforgiveness. But sometimes it is. Many times it is. And they're even bringing that in to treat people to receive physical healing. Joyce Meyer says this, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping that the other person will die. In other words, unforgiveness is holding me in a prison. Not them, they've moved on and probably forgotten about this issue, or maybe not even aware of how much hurt they've caused. And we'll talk about what is forgiveness not. We're going to get there, because sometimes that's the first question we ask. And so, It's like drinking poison, hoping the other person will die, but we are the ones ending up being hurt. 
And so something that the Lord also revealed to me is that sometimes we will think of unforgiveness and think, oh, well, I don't have a problem with unforgiveness. I can't have mind, you know. I can't have any quarrels with anyone. But sometimes I'll think of someone or someone will maybe walk into a room or I'll hear a conversation, a story about someone. But a feeling comes from the inside when I think about them. Something comes out of my mouth that doesn't sound so good when I talk about them. So sometimes we can think we've forgiven, but what has stayed behind in our heart is a root of bitterness or resentment. And that, the Bible says, is a very dangerous thing. Because bitterness is many times the root of many other sins. And I've heard scholars also talk about the sleeper sin. In other words, it can remain undetected in our hearts unless we can hear it in our words we can recognize it in our thoughts when we think about someone, you know, or you can recognize, someone else might recognize the way you talk about someone, but sometimes we won't recognize it ourselves. There's a scripture in the Bible that speaks about this, Ephesians 4, verse 31 to 32, where Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, get rid of it, because it will poison everything else in your life. It will poison all of my relationships. It will poison us within the church if we hold on to that bitterness. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Verse 32, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I want to read another translation. It's not on the screen. I think it's in your U-Vision notes. That says, lay aside bitter words. Just lay it aside. Temper tantrums. Weet al temper tantrum gegooi en jy is nie meer toe nie. Allemaal van ons. I thought that was funny. Lay aside temper tantrums. I received that, Lord. Revenge, profanity, and insults. But instead, be kind and affectionate towards one another. This one cuts. It says, has God graciously forgiven you? Then graciously forgive one another. Hebrews 12, 15, it's not on your notes. It says, a root of bitterness will be poisonous and corrupt many. So it's a dangerous thing that we want to get rid of. We want to ask Holy Spirit to just pull that out of our heart, no matter how much it hurts, but so that it is out. And so I want to share a little bit about what is forgiveness, because let's also be really clear. What are we talking about when we say, because sometimes I will talk about forgiveness and Johannes will talk, you know, but maybe all of us have a different definition of that. There's on the screen a definition will come up. What is forgiveness? It is a conscious, deliberate decision to release. Everyone say deliberate decision. To release feelings of resentment, bitterness, or vengeance towards a person or a group who has harmed you. And this is where it sometimes hurts, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. They don't have to deserve forgiveness for us to extend forgiveness. Amen? It means to pardon someone for their sins, to let go of the offense against you. And so I want us to also think about, you know, the Lord also spoke to me about this in my everyday journey. Like I'm not in a place where I, you know, I have a grudge against anyone or I have this huge problem with unforgiveness, but the Lord reminded me, how many times a day do you get offended? Even it's a claim, Vicky. Yes, I owe you the way. Look, because no offended. And sometimes we don't even deal with that. Like I'm guilty of this. Like sometimes I don't even think about it, but yes, then that person's name comes up, but then stone or so much of a dung in your opening. Yeah, I get that problem with all. I know I'm talking to all of us. So even if we if we don't feel like this message speak to a situation in your life today, you'll need it tomorrow, Monday morning. Get into the office. Oh my word! Then that person comes in again. I was like, no, so on that offended. You'll need it next week. You'll need it next month. None of us will go through life without needing to forgive, without needing to extend mercy or grace to someone somewhere. 
And so it hits home for all of us. All right, so next one, what is forgiveness not? And this is very, very important. What is forgiveness not? These are, and I think there's many more, but, you know, I don't want to keep you here. We've got a worship night at six. We're not going to spend all day talking about this, but I think we can. But these are lies that I feel and that I see in ministry that we as people believe that gives us reason not to extend forgiveness or that makes it difficult for us to release forgiveness. Number one, a lie that we believe what is forgiveness not is, well, if I forgive them, I won't receive justice for my pain. If I forgive them, it'll condone what they did or it will mean that nothing happens to them. They, they do not have to work through any consequences of the wrong that they've done, of the sin that they've committed, of the hurt that they've caused. And you know, we know that as believers, when we read the word of God, when we study God's word, we know that that is a lie. We know that the Father says, every single one of us, if you are breathing and you are a living being person, we are all going to stand in front of the Lord and be accountable for everything we did, every word we spoke, every motivation of our heart. So there's no escaping for anyone when it comes to that. How and when people work through their consequences, however, is not up to us. And this is where the problem comes in, where in our flesh, it is natural for us to want that vengeance. This is what I often hear from people. I want to hurt them as much as they hurt me. Or I want them to experience the same pain I experienced. And this is the dangerous place that we can find ourselves in, because if that is going to be our uh, thought process, if that's the way we're going to look at it, then that means we are going to stay in that place of that prison of unforgiveness. We're not going to be free. We're not going to walk in the fullness of the calling that God has for us. And it also has implications to the other people as well. God does not want us to get onto the judgment throne. I'm preaching to myself this morning. He doesn't want us on that throne. Because what happens if I step into the throne into the place of judgment where I want to be responsible for Jock at my new seer gemaak, ek wil nou seker maak Jock kry wat hy verdien. Okay. Hy moet seer kry soos ek seer gekry het. The moment I do that, I step into a place of wanting to be in the father's role. I step, we should have brought the umbrella, Johannes' favorite illustration. I step out from the umbrella of protection and covering of the Lord. I step into the prison. And I open up the door for the torturers to come and torture me physically, spiritually, and emotionally, mentally. Would you agree this morning? People will still receive consequences and walk through things that they do. Sometimes, I mean, if someone did something illegally, you know, the laws of the land will dictate sometimes they need to do time, they need to go to prison, you know. Whatever, there's different ways that people will walk through, justice systems will work, and if it doesn't work, it is still up to the Lord to give what they deserve. It is not up to us. So I think sometimes this is the hardest thing for us to work through, to step, to avoid stepping into that place of judgment where we want to do the Lord's job for Him because of our pain. Why do we step into that place? It's because of pain. But what does the Bible say? Who is our comforter? Who is the one that will heal us from the inside out? It is the Holy Spirit. There's healing available for all of our pain. Number two, a lie that we believe, if I forgive, I must immediately trust them again. We know that's not true. Okay, we see this many times in marriage. You know, if you walk through a couple in marriage and something has happened in a marriage and trust was broken... Who knows that forgiveness is given immediately, but trust has to be rebuilt. Trust has to be earned again. So just because I, and this depends on the, obviously of, uh, you know, the relationship. When you talk about a marriage, it's different than we're talking about someone that broke into your home that you have no relationship with. Obviously, I don't know that I'm going to trust the burglar that maybe came into my house and stole everything. But it's different when I'm working through a process of reconciliation. Okay, so trust 
doesn't have to automatically be there. It can't be there. If it was broken, it needs to be earned again. You know, there needs to be repentance. And that's when we even talk about reconciliation. In some situations, like a marriage, you know, reconciliation can be an option, but only if both people agree. All right? So I know I'm going into, like, counseling territory, but this is important. This is important because we, I don't know that we receive enough teaching and guidance upon this. And that's why sometimes we have so many challenges in our relationships. Maybe if it was a friend that, you know, continuously hurt me, maybe I can forgive, but I don't know that I trust them in my life in this season, so I maybe need to put a healthy boundary on what does the proximity of this relationship look like. You know, there's many, you hear what I'm saying, there's many different ways of handling different things, but when it comes to the principle of forgiveness, the principle is, I must release it immediately, but trust is built over time. It's earned with time. Number three, if I forgive, there must be reconciliation. Again, no, not necessarily. If something happened to me, if, you know, by some stranger and they came and they hurt me or they did something to me, I don't need to be reconciled to them. You know, I can move on with my life. I just need to release forgiveness so that I get free. And I must trust God's justice and God's, uh, vindication in that situation. But reconciliation, for example, in a marriage is always God's heart. So there's always processes of how do we work there. And sometimes it is a process. Sometimes it's a journey, but forgiveness is immediate. Do you hear the difference this morning? Okay. Yeah. Number four. The fourth lie is I must first work through my emotions and my pain before I'm ready to forgive. And I think this is the biggest one that really hurts at the core. Because no, that's not what the Lord is asking us to do. Because if we wait for that moment, we will wait for it for eternity. We will never be ready if we first want to work through emotions. Forgiveness, the deliberate decision to um iemand vrij te spreek, to pardon them, to let them go is the starting point of my healing. Because then I open up the door instead for the enemy. I close it to him and I open it for his Holy Spirit to come in and to start the healing work in my heart. That's where the different door opens up when I make that decision. It is impossible without the Lord to start this process. You know, Jesus hung on that cross. And what did he say? He prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He was in the middle of pain, excruciating pain at that. He didn't wait for his pain to be healed. He released them immediately. And I feel like that's our example. As painful as it feels maybe for some, that's our example. And before I end off this service, I want to pray for some people. But I want to show you a quick video clip. And just before the team plays it, I didn't know the fullness of this lady's story. I always heard of her. Who's heard of uh, Corrie Ten Boom? What an incredible woman. If you've never heard her story, I said, Johannes, I want to read her book, The Hiding Place. So she, she passed away in 1983. I think that's like 40 years ago. But she was a Dutch woman. And with her family in the Netherlands, they, some people say, over 800 Jews through the period, through the years that they were doing this, they were hiding Jews from the Nazi oppressors in the Netherlands in their home. They actually had built a fake wall in their house. And at any given point, they would have between 30 and 40 people, Jews, hidden inside of their house, out of sight. I mean, this woman found uh, food coupons to bless them with food and all these things. And, you know, if they got caught, and it is what happened, they would go to the concentration camps themselves. And so she has an incredible story, um, but what had happened is that her family, together with her dad and um, her siblings, they all got arrested and they got sent to um, a concentration camp, but one of the worst ones at that. And the, she somehow later, they, um, they called it a system error, and she was released, and she could come back to the Netherlands. But just after she was released, they said it was actually a mistake because all the other people that were in the chamber or in the camp with her were sent to the gas chambers. 
And I believe there was some kind of favor of God upon this woman's life, but she has a powerful testimony of forgiveness. So let's look at the screen. It's only two minutes. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin. And there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel overseers, guards, in the concentra in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian. I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. But then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom, once in me forgiven, will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw, when I experienced that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself have no forgiveness. Do you know that Jesus has said that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. And I, I knew, oh, I am not ready for Jesus' coming because I have no forgiveness for my sins. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. That was powerful, eh? I watched that video and I said to Johannes, who of us can actually imagine being in a position like that? She literally saw, as I go and read about her story, it became more impactful to me. Some of these women had to walk naked past those oppressive jailers. And yet, once she found the overwhelming love of the Father for her and forgiveness for her, she was able to do the supernatural thing to say, Brother, I forgive you. You who killed my family and basically millions of other people. But she could forgive. And so, church, I want to encourage us this morning if this is an area in your life that the Lord is speaking to you about, I want to encourage you this morning to make a decision to let it go. And for some of us, maybe this morning it's something huge. Maybe for some of us, it's something small. But I want to encourage you, even if it is something small, let it go as quickly as you can so it doesn't become something big. Because even a a little bit of an open door is still an open door. And I don't know about you, but I want to walk in the fullness of the freedom that Jesus has for me. My husband deserves it. Our church deserves it. Your children deserve it. The generation that comes after you deserve it. Because sometimes even these things, if we don't deal with it, our children will have to deal with it. Things pass down generations. And so, before we end off the service, how can I then truly forgive? Number one, 
it starts by receiving God's love for me. And team can put up the last slide with some background music. It helps me to pray. I must receive God's love and forgiveness for me. Romans 5, 5. God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Number two, I need to decide to forgive. I just need to make a decision. Healing, restoration, and my emotions will follow. I just need to take the first step. And then Jesus comes and takes us the rest of the way. She could not extend her hand without the Lord. But when she did, He did the rest. She ended up having an incredible ministry all over the world, sharing the power of forgiveness and her story. And millions of people, I mean, we're still being impacted by it today. God brings beauty for ashes, no matter what the story is. Number three, the Lord will lead us to pray for those who had hurt us because that's part of our, recon- or that's part of our healing process. I don't know if you know the story of Joyce Meyer. I was privileged to work for her ministry and I heard her story many, many, many times from the inside out and I'm still impacted by it this morning. But her father raped her more than 200 times when she was a child. And the Lord took her through this process of years and years and years before she started her ministry. Now the ministry is more than 40 years old. And she said that in her latter years when she was in her 60s, She felt the Holy Spirit prompt her. She thought she had forgiven her father and her mother for seeing everything and never doing anything about it. And she said it was actually harder to forgive her mother, who knew but didn't do anything about it, than it was to forgive her dad for what he did. And the Lord asked her in her older years with her husband to go and take care of them, to buy them a home, to buy their groceries, to take care of them. And she said that's when she realized some of those roots of bitterness and you know, resentment came out and she was like, Lord, you cannot possibly expect me to do that. And he said, yes, I can. And together with her husband, they did and they started doing all these things and they bought them a house and, and her husband is a very godly man and together they started praying again in a new way for her dad and for her mom. And then I think they were doing it for two years And suddenly her mom called her one day and said, I don't know what's going on, but your dad has been crying for weeks. And he's never admitted to this day, this was years down the line, he had never to this day admitted what he had done to her. And she went, her and Dave went, and they went to the dad, and in that moment, he got onto his knees and he said, I am so sorry for what I had done to you, what I had stolen from your life. And they were able to lead him to Jesus, they were able to baptize him, and he died shortly thereafter. But what is so profound about that story to me is that the Bible says it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. What did the father already knew was those acts of kindness, even though they did not deserve an inch of it. The Bible speaks about heaping coals on on your enemy's head. The kindness and the goodness and the blessing and the mercy that is heaped upon their head will lead them to repentance. And she was able to do that. And again, same thing beauty for ashes. God has used her story all over the world to heal people, to restore people, and to bring people into his kingdom. So why don't you close your eyes this morning? And I want to pray for some people. If you are here this morning, and I want you to just, it's just a couple of moments longer, but it is so important. You can close your eyes and just focus on the Holy Spirit. If there is anyone here in this room and you've heard us speak about the love of Jesus and the mercy of Jesus and the forgiveness of of the Lord. But if you're honest, maybe you've even been in church your whole life, but if you're honest, you've never actually ever received the Lord's forgiveness for your sins. You've never received the love of the Father for you. You've never made a deliberate decision to repent of your sins, to turn to Jesus and to say to Jesus, Lord, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I want to be called a child of God. I want you to just raise your hand. I'm just going to pray for you. If you're being really honest, because we cannot talk about forgiveness when we don't start there. Thank you, Lord. Okay. 
And then if you're sitting here this morning and maybe this, you feel like this message is speaking to you about a situation in your life and you know that the Lord is tugging on your heart to release someone this morning. Maybe it's more than one person. Maybe you need to forgive yourself this morning for something maybe you did and, and you cannot forgive yourself. You're struggling with yourself. Maybe you're here and you need to forgive the Lord because you're angry with Him for something that happened to you and you believe He should have done something about it. Maybe it's time to forgive the Lord this morning. Maybe you've been, and we see this so much, maybe you've been in a church and church hurt you. People in church have hurt you. And it's caused you to be distrustful and really hard to slot into another church again and to feel safe in the family of God because people in the church have hurt you. Maybe it's time to release people or the church as a whole this morning and forgive. And I want to ask if that is you, I want you to just gently raise your hand so I can see you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being honest this morning. This is a huge step forward to be released from mental torment, to be released from emotional burdens that you're carrying that is just too heavy. Leave it at the altar this morning. I'm going to lead us in a prayer and I'm going to ask everyone to just pray it together. You can just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for first forgiving me. Today I receive your mercy. I receive your kindness and your total forgiveness for my sins as I humble myself before you. Lord, this morning, I need help to forgive. Today, I want to make a decision to release them. And you can even speak to the Lord about any particular person by name. Please fill me, Jesus with your love and because of your love I release this person I release myself I release you today I forgive I release them for everything they've done to me and I ask that you will be my vindicator and I release them into your hands. Jesus, today I break a spirit of unforgiveness over my life. Today I'm going to walk out of this prison with relief over my mind, freedom over my emotions, and healing in my body. In the name of Jesus, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and guide me in a process of healing and of restoration. I pray that you'll give me wisdom, you'll give me discernment, and you'll give me safe people and a church community to journey with me. I bless them this morning, Lord. I pray for my enemies that you would touch them with the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.